I'm starting a new series this morning called The Power of His Resurrection. We did a series of several, a couple months ago about um, knowing Jesus and the fellowship of his suffering. The Apostle Paul was talking about he wanted to know Christ and the, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. And I'm starting a series today called The Power of His Resurrection, The Power of His Resurrection. And I was thinking this week about the time, about what, what did Jesus' resurrection mean to his followers, to the people that were closest to him nearly 2,000 years ago, people that were uh, had served him and had loved him, and I was thinking through the different people. Uh, but you know, there was a lot of people just outside the 10 or 12 original uh, apostles, the 12 apostles, or what we call the 12 disciples. Jesus had more disciples than 12. He had hundreds, and, and he had thousands of people that loved him, people that he had changed their life. Think about the widow of Nain, who he had interrupted her son's funeral. There was a funeral procession, and the disciples were passing by, and they got caught up in the funeral procession, and here comes this woman, a widow of Nain, who's now, who's lost her son, and her, the body of her son is there, and they bump into Jesus, and Jesus decides to interrupt the funeral and raise her son from the dead. Think about blind uh, Bartimaeus, who was on the road to Jericho, on the road to Jericho, was crying out to Jesus, uh, son of mercy, son of David, have mercy, son of David, have mercy, and I think about how did those people feel that day when they realized that the the one that had raised them from to, to raise their son to life, the one that had healed their eyes, the one that had changed their lives, had been arrested and had been tried and had been found to be guilty and had been found to be worthy of death. How did they feel when they heard that he died? And how did they feel when they heard that now he's been laid in a tomb? It's over with. It's over. And I think about not just 11 people, but hundreds of people, hundreds of people, people like Lazarus, who Jesus had raised him from the dead and Mary and Martha, the siblings. How would you feel if somebody who had raised your brother from the dead and you realize that they had that they're after him they're trying to arrest him now they've arrested him now he's tried he was found guilty he was condemned to death now they killed him and I think about these disciples and not, not just 11 people but hundreds of people and how they may have felt and I don't know how they all felt but I do know how some of them felt because it's recorded in the Bible how some of them felt in the words that described how they were feeling that Sunday morning morning, early on that Sunday morning when they got up, many of them were confused. Many of them were very discouraged. Many of them were deeply stricken with grief. They were hopeless. They were afraid. They were hiding. Some of the uh, ones that were closest to Jesus were afraid the same thing might happen to them. And so they were hiding behind locked doors and they were wondering what in the world was going on. And many of them felt like there's no hope left in life. Everything we put our life into and our hope into is now gone because Jesus, we thought he was a Messiah, but evidently he's not because he's, he's dead now and it's over with. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt hopeless before? How many ever had a time where you felt hopeless? I can think back in my life, there's been a couple of times where I felt hopeless. And if you're a part of this church, you've heard me tell the stories before, but my, when my dad got transferred to Miami and he told me, Hey, I'm, we're moving to Miami from George, from Smyrna, Georgia to Miami. And I thought that's to be good. We're moving by the beach. We live 15 minutes from the beach. I can go out to the beach. And, and, and I moved down to Miami and I got in such a culture shock. I didn't know what was going to hit me. I had no idea they would not have sweet tea in Miami. I didn't think there was anywhere in the world where they wouldn't have sweet tea. And they didn't have a Chick-fil-A. And I thought, God, why would you move me to a place that doesn't have a Chick-fil-A and that doesn't have a sweet tea? What kind of God would do that to a 16-year-old, to a young man? And I started, I would go up and I didn't realize that a lot of people in certain places didn't speak English and I thought that people were being rude to me and they won't even talk to me and, and I experienced what was no, what I didn't know it was just culture shock and I had culture shock and I could remember though that for a time in my life I felt hopeless I felt absolutely hopeless my, I had lo, felt like I had lost all my friends everything that I knew I felt like I was completely alone anybody ever felt hopeless before? 
And I can remember a time later in my life when I was in my early 30s and I had little kids and I went to the doctor and they said, we're going to have to do a biopsy of your esophagus and we're going to have to do a biopsy of your stomach. And I can remember waking up from that. uh, And the reason I went to the doctor is because I had weighed about 185 pounds and over a period of about five months, I'd went from about 185 pounds to about 135 pounds because I couldn't eat because my stomach would have hurt and everything that I ate made me feel, feel nauseous. And, and I could barely, I didn't have the energy to go into work and I was anxious and I was upset. And I can remember waking up from that procedure they did and she said, I took a little biopsy of your esophagus and I took a little biopsy of your stomach, but I tell you right now, it didn't look good. When I looked at it, it didn't look good. It, it, looked, it looked bad down in there. And I can remember feeling hopeless. I can remember feeling hopeless and, and I can remember just feeling like, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? I have young kids. It seemed like I had my life ahead of me and I felt terrible every day and how am I going to live my life like this and and if you've ever felt hopeless before you can probably relate a little bit to the how the followers of Jesus were feeling because like I said they were afraid they were confused they were uh, many of them were filled with doubt and grief and just grief stricken they had gone from the high to the low they had followed this man who had healed people and fed people he had challenged the religious systems of the day he had reached out and loved people that nobody else would love. He had, he had accepted this man Zacchaeus that was, he was in his own category. He was, there was sinners and then there was tax collectors and the tax collectors were worse than anybody because they cheated people out of their money. And how many of you know, if you cheat somebody out of their money, that you're worse than everybody. And so the tax collectors were the worst category, but Jesus looked at Zacchaeus and said, come down today. I'm going to have dinner with you. And Zacchaeus said, if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay him back. And so many people that had been through life transformation. What about the woman that that was caught in the act of adultery and they drag her before Jesus and said, the law says to stone her, what do you think we ought to do? And Jesus got her out of that situation and said, woman, go and sin no more. How do you think those people felt on that day? Somebody that had changed their life so drastically, so radically, and now they're hearing he's dead. He was arrested. He was found guilty. He was killed. He's dead. He's, He's gone. It's over. And they were filled with grief. The Bible says they were filled with confusion, doubt, fear, grief, hiding. But they had yet to experience the resurrection power. Because I'm going to tell you, you can be filled with grief. You can be filled with sadness in your life. You can be filled with doubt and fear and confusion. But when you experience resurrection power, it turns all that around. And your grief turns to joy. And I was thinking about the resurrection power. What does it mean? Not just in their life, but what does the resurrection power mean in your life, in my life. And I'm telling you, uh, I, I didn't even read my scripture. I got a little too excited, but let's read the scripture. It's Philippians chapter three, verse 10. It's the, uh, the apostle Paul. And he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. How many of you want to experience the power of his resurrection? I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. How many want to experience participation in his sufferings? See, nobody raised their hand on that one. Just Vinny. Just me and Vinny. But here's the thing. We went through this series. Of, it, we, we suffer with him. We're not immune as believers. You're not immune to difficulty. But if I'm going to experience the suffering over the past couple of weeks, yeah, I had COVID. I, 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 he, I was lying in bed. I was tired. I was sick. I didn't feel well. Somebody told me this morning, if anybody says, it's nothing. That's because they hadn't had it. And I said, yeah, that's, I agree because it was tough and I'm still trying to get my energy back. But if I'm going to participate in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, then I'm going to also participate in the power of his resurrection. And I want to walk, I want to walk in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him. It's what Paul said. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is that they were hiding. They were afraid. They were confused. They were filled with doubt. They were filled with fear. They were stricken with grief until they saw the risen Savior. And when they saw the risen Savior, that turned everything around. And the group of afraid, upset, confused, doubting people turned into this group of believers that went out and just started telling everybody about Jesus. And that's the power of his resurrection. It didn't just change 
changed their life forever. It changes your life and my life forever when we're walking in the power of the resurrection. He appeared after his resurrection to over 500 people over a period of 40 days. And those are the first witnesses. That's the foundation church. They're the ones that went out and told everybody about Jesus. And so let's take today just a few moments to see a few short truths. And I'm going to continue in this series, but uh, just a few brief truths about the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number one, the power of his resurrection turns doubt in, into belief. The resurrection has the power to turn your doubt into belief, into belief. And if you've ever questioned your faith before, if you've ever had doubts about your faith, you know, some of the things that we read about in the word of God are, are pretty amazing. And sometimes they're difficult to believe. Would you, would, would you agree? Would anybody agree? Sometimes they're pretty amazing. Uh, like Jonah, what about the story that a man was swallowed by a fish and he lived in the stomach of that fish for three days? So what about the disciples? They were out on the boat and Jesus came to them and he came walking on the water. And we see some of these stories that are, they're incredible. They sound unbelievable. And the, many of the disciples, after Jesus died, even though he told them, I'm going to die and I'm going to come back to life, but they were filled with doubt. Many of the disciples were filled with doubt. Have you ever heard of this one apostle that they call Thomas? But what do they say before Thomas? They call him Doubting Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas because he didn't believe because when he, the disciples were all together on Sunday morning, they came together and then Thomas went out to get groceries or to get some food or something and he was out for about a little while, maybe about an hour or so. And when he got back, he says, guys, I'm back. I got the food. Did I miss anything? Can you imagine being that guy? You go out and you come back and you say, what did I miss? Say, ah, nothing much. Jesus came by for a little while, um, hung out with us. Uh, we had some folks, whenever any, somebody misses church and they, ha, they say, I had to miss church. They say, I miss church. I say, how was it? I always tell them, I say, it's the best service we ever had. I mean, it was, um, I mean, it was insane. Probably never be another one like it. <laughs> That's what the pastors do. Um, he went out. That's why I tell you COVID has been so tough because it split you know, people up and you miss. He went out. He went out for a little while. He went out for a little while and he comes back and he said, what did I miss? And they said, nothing other than Jesus showed up. He's alive. We saw him. And look at this, John chapter 20. Poor Thomas. Poor Thomas. John chapter 20, verse 24. Now, Thomas, also called Didymus, he was a, a twin. And, uh, or he was called twin. One of the 12 who was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And I'm telling you, there are some things in this world that are, that are they're incredible. There are some things in this world that are incredible, and yet they're true. I was reading online this week that an average cumulus a, a cloud, a cumulus cloud, how much would you guess a, a cloud weighs? I mean, it's up there just floating in the air. But if you take the water that some of them are like a kilometer by a kilometer, if you take and how high they are, if you take the water in that cloud and you measure the density of the water and you measure the volume of the water, that the average cumulus cloud weighs 1.1 million pounds. That's how much that cloud weighs. Now, it sounds uh, um, incredible. It sounds unbelievable. But if you could look it up, that it's true that the average cumulus cloud weighs 1.1 million pounds. Some things sound incredible and they are incredible. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is incredible, isn't it? It's incredible. But there are some things on this earth that might sound incredible just because they sound incredible does not make them false. I was reading this story uh, and this woman in Bangladesh in 2019, in February 2019, she was pregnant and she goes to the hospital and she gives birth to this beautiful baby in February 2019. 
Now, most people, they wait a little while, maybe a few years before they have another baby. If they've just had a baby, they wait a little while. But this woman didn't wait very long before she had another baby. Because after February 2019, after she gave birth to that baby, she went back to the hospital in March 2019, one month later, and gave birth to twins one month later. Now, that sounds kind of unbelievable, doesn't it? But go and look it up. It's on Fox News. It's on CNN. It's on all the news sites. They found out that this lady actually was born with a... Uh, irregularity. She was born with two wombs and she had one baby in one womb that she gave birth to in February 2019. She had two more babies in her other womb that she gave birth to a month later. That's, that's cranking them out right there. Now, you, you, tell a, you tell a family member, yeah, I had a baby in February and we're having two more in March. Um, you, you're going to get some eye rolls you're going to get some people saying, you know what? You have lost it. You have lost it. You're a, you're a liar, basically. But it's on all the news sites, and it's got the, the, got the things there. The doctor said this woman was born with two separate wombs, and she had a baby in February. And then in one month later, she had two more babies out of the other womb. It sounds incredible. It sounds unbelievable. And I can see all the doubting Thomases right now. You're going to go look it up. I see some people trying to go get their phone and everything because doubting Thomas, okay? Doubting Thomas. You don't believe because it sounds like it sounds incredible. It sounds too good to be true. It sounds too something. I don't know if it sounds too good to be true, but it sounds too something to be true. But here's the thing. To Jesus, Thomas wasn't doubting Thomas. To Jesus, Thomas was the missionary, evangelist, apostle Thomas who started as many churches or maybe more churches as a lot of the other apostles because according to Christian history, he went into India and he started hundreds and hundreds of churches and he told tens of thousands of people that Jesus was was alive. And then 72 AD, he had a spear thrust through him and he died for Christ. And he is the apostle Thomas to which the cathedral of the apostle Thomas is named after. He's not doubting Thomas because Jesus was okay with Thomas's doubts, but he didn't want Thomas to stay in his doubt. He wanted Thomas to believe. And so a whole week later, and I guarantee you, Thomas never left after that. He said, Hey, anybody want to go out and get some bread? We need some food. Thomas said, not it. All right, I'm not going. I'm not leaving this place. And so in a week later, John 20, verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. I bet he was with them. Though the doors were locked, the doors were locked. They were in fear. They were in doubt. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, oh, by the way, Thomas, put your finger here. Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand. Put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And I want to tell that person today, you may be watching online and you may be in here, and you hear about a man being swallowed up by a whale. You hear about a man walking on water. You hear about a man coming from the dead, and you say, it sounds incredible. But I want to tell you, there are some things that although they sound incredible, they're true. And one of the things that sounds incredible that is true is on the third day, Jesus was not there because he got up, he came out of the grave, and he's alive. He's alive. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, see, what I'm telling you is the resurrection power turns doubt into belief. Here's a man that said, I won't believe unless I see it. Jesus said, okay, put, it, put your hand there. Put your hand there then. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. That's us. That's you. You're blessed. You didn't see, but you believe because you believe the testimony of the apostles and the disciples that saw Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit came inside of you and lives in you to guarantee it. I love that song because it says, because I, I, I know he lives because he lives inside of me. I may not even be talking about the right song. I get all those old songs mixed up. <laughs> Blessed are you who believe that have not seen. Blessed are you that have believed. And I want to just speak to those that may have doubts right now. Is that Jesus wants to, he wants to, he wants to encourage your doubts. He wants you to believe. Here's people that have witnessed miracles and they testified all over the world that Jesus was the Christ. Many of them were killed. Most of them were killed. 
And they refused to recount. The people said, we're going to stop saying you saw Jesus alive. We're go- we'll beat you. Beat me then. I saw it. I saw it. And he appeared to over 500 people. And it wasn't just the 11. We're going to we'll kill you if you keep saying he's alive. You'll have to kill me then. I saw him alive. We saw him alive. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says that Jesus was declared, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection. How does Christ's resurrection turn doubt into belief? It confirms that he is the Messiah and the Lord. When they saw him get up from the grave, they knew with certainty he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. That's why Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, he's not just a great prophet. Like I said earlier, we can go to Muhammad. You can go to his burial place. He's, he died. He's, he's there. He didn't come back to life. He's buried in somewhere in Saudi Arabia. You can go see the remains of Buddha. It's, he, was, he died. He was cremated. It's somewhere in India. But the believers, we serve a risen Savior. I've been inside his tomb. He's not there. Back in those days, they used to lay the body there for a year, and they would let it decompose. They would take the bones, they put the bones in the ossuary, they would sit the ossuary there in the tomb, and I'm going to tell you, there's no tomb, there's no ossuary in Jesus' tomb, because as King David said, he, you will not let your servant see decay. His body didn't have time to see decay. Joseph of Arimathea, he, he, he loaned the tomb, he was a rich man, and he loaned the tomb to Christ because Christ was only going to need it for the weekend, because he's alive. Praise the Lord. How do we know that, how does his resurrection turn out into belief? It confirms that he is the Messiah and the Lord. The second point is the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of power. It turns confusion into clarity. It turns confusion into clarity. Have you ever experienced something in your life that was unpleasant and it didn't make any sense at the time, but later it made sense? Anybody? I was, when I was going through those times of hopelessness in my life, especially when I was young down in Miami, and I was going through that time of hopelessness, I really didn't understand why God would let me go through something like that. I mean, I look back on it and I think, you know, uh, I mean, I was okay. I had a roof over my head and I had food and things like that. But it's, then I can remember how hopeless I felt. And I, would, I loved God. I was serving God. How would God let me get to that point where I felt so hopeless because because I felt hopeless at that time and it didn't make any sense. But the thing is, now that I look back on it as a young man, I see that when I started to feel so hopeless, I started to run to God. And I ran to my church and I got involved in the church and I started memorizing scripture and I started digging into the word of God and I started call, crying out to God. And I look back on it and I see what God did in my life through that time and I realized why he allowed me to go through that. And at the, then I was, I was confused. I didn't understand why it was happening. And But now I understand because there's some things in life that you don't understand till later. It's so unpleasant while you're going through it that you don't understand till later. And there was, there was confusion. They didn't understand because they thought he's the Messiah. He's going to go uh, over. Th- he's going to kick the Roman government out. He's going to re- restore our nation. He's going to strengthen our nation. But now he's dead. And it was, it's interesting because on at least four different occasions, on at least four different occasions, Jesus sat them down and said, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed and I'm going to race, be raised to life on the third day and on, at least on four different occasions he told them that but when they died, when he died they had no clue what was going on anybody except for me in here dense sometimes anybody just a little slow look at this, let, let me read you, these scriptures are not on the screen but let me read you this Matthew chapter 17 verse 22, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, this is what Jesus said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him on the third day. He will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Three verse, three chapters later, Matthew chapter 20 verse 17. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem on the way. He took the 12 aside and said to them, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and he will, they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and be flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. One chapter later, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And then he must be killed. And on the third day, he'd be raised to life. I love this one right here. Uh, Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 31. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. He had already told them four times, look, we're going to Jerusalem. 
I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. And the third day, I'm going to rise. Then he pulled him over to the side. And he said, hey, guys, hey, let me remind you something. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. And the third day, I'm going to come back to life. Then he pulled him over again. And he said, guys, hey, anybody's a little slow except for besides me. He pulled him over and he said, guys, let me remind you something. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. And the third day, I'm going to come to life. And the Bible says that they didn't know what he, what does he mean by that? Like, what is he talking about? And so they're afraid to ask him. And I would have loved to, I would have loved to have that scripture where they just ask him, like, what are you talking about? And I want to see him say again, hey, here's what I'm talking about. I'm going up there. I'm going to be killed. And then I'm going to come back to life. And then he went up there. I'm messing my notes up. He went up there and then he was killed. And they said, it's over. It's over. I mean, it's over now. I don't know what we're going to do. I'm scared of hiding. But you know what? That's how we are sometimes. Sometimes there was, there was confusion. There was confusion. And the, on the road to Emmaus, he was walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. On his resurrection, Jesus would, he appeared to the women at the tomb. Then he appeared to Peter. Then he appeared to these two disciples. They were walking. They're not named, but they were walking seven miles. And he walked with them for seven miles. And he was kept by the Holy Spirit. He was, they were kept by recognizing. And he said, hey, what are you, where are you guys going? And they said, we're leaving. Well, what are you up to? And they said, haven't you heard everything? There was a guy, and he, we thought he was a Messiah. And then he was just killed. Well, what's all that? about and for seven miles and, and he says that he opened their eyes and he helped them to understand the scripture Luke 24 when he appeared to his disciples Luke 24 45 it says then he opened their minds so that they could understand scriptures I want to tell you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ it brings clarity to the scriptures it brings clarity to God's plan and it helps us to understand it's a mystery that was hidden for ages and thousands and thousands of years this mystery was hidden how is God going to fix all this how is God going to redeem us? How's, how can God pull us into his family? But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the scriptures have become clear that God's plan for salvation was to send his son to die on the cross, to pull even the Gentiles into his family. And it's the, how is Christ's resurrection turn confusion into clarity? It clearly reveals God's plan of salvation to us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 25, uh, he says, Paul says, I become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I'm telling you, it's only that we can fully understand God's plan. It's only that we can fully understand our purpose in life when we experience the power of the resurrection and how the fact that Christ suffered, he died, and then he got up. And because he got up, we're now a part of his family and we have purpose and we have life. It turns confusion into clarity. And the last thing about the resurrection power today, and we're going to continue in this series, but the last thing about the resurrection power is it turns grief into joy. It turns grief into joy. Now, grief is normal. Um, as I've told you many times that as Christians, we're not immune to pain. We're not immune to suffering. We're not immune to sickness. We're not immune to Grief, and from time to time we experience, uh, we experience, and there's nothing abnormal about it. But Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 20, he warned them, he said, Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. And he was talking about his death because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be happy about it. But while they're happy, you are going to weep and mourn. You will grieve, but look at this, but your grief will turn into joy. And like I said earlier, I don't know how. All of the 500 people, 600 people, 1,000 people, I don't know how they felt that early that Sunday morning before they knew Jesus was alive, but I know for many of them, they were deeply stricken with grief. They had watched, they had, the women, they, many of the women were there and they witnessed a, a torture. They witnessed taking a spike and drive it through his hands, his feet. They saw him was beat, skin off his back. Something that the crucifixion was, the word excruciating means out of the cross, out of, because crucifixion was torture. And the person was, was, was hanging there and they, they suffocated to death. 
That's how they died. It was a slow, agonizing, painful death. And the women, the women, many of the women were there and they watched it. And they, this, this, some of them, this man had just changed their lives and they watched him be, they watched, they knew he was arrested. He was tried. He was found guilty and he was killed. And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time on TV. If I'm watching a show and it has a little surgery or something on that, I, I, look, I, I look at something else. I look at my phone. Anybody else a little squeamish? I'm a little bit squeamish. Uh, I probably would have been like the other disciples that day. They were hiding. They didn't witness the resurrection. But to many of them, they were grieving. They were shocked and, and grief-stricken. And that morning, these women that had been there, Early after the Sabbath, they couldn't go anywhere because of the Sabbath. And then after the Sabbath, early that morning, they come to the tomb. They were hoping that the guards would maybe roll away the stone so they could do the customary things, the little things they needed to do, and then they could get back out of there. But they were going to the tomb, and when they got to the tomb that morning, they saw that the, the guards weren't there. They saw the stone had already been rolled away. And they saw on that morning, if you look at the gospel account, they saw two angels. And when they came in, one of them said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He's risen. He's alive. And shortly thereafter, when they left the the tomb, they, Jesus appeared. Mary Magdalene was the first person that Jesus appeared to, and her grief turned to joy, because the thing about it is, is that you may go through grief and suffering in your life, and we do even as believers, you may go through grief and suffering, but the grief is always short-lived. It's always temporary, because the resurrection power gives us a reason to rejoice. It gives us a reason. That's why the apostles, when they went out, when they would get beaten, and they would throw them in prison, and at midnight, what were they doing in the prison? They were singing and they were rejoicing because they know I may get beaten today, but I have a hope and I have a future and my pain is always temporary. First Peter chapter one, verse three, it says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you through, who, uh, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In, look at this. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs and all kind of trials. How does Christ's resurrection turn grief into joy? It gives us a new life, a renewed purpose, and an eternal hope. And so here's the thing that going back to where I started is that the apostle Paul in prison there, he wrote in Philippians, he said, I want to know Christ. I want to know him in his sufferings. Yes, but I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. How many want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection? Walking in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Yes, but also if I'm going to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, I'm going to know him in the power of his resurrection too. And that power, that resurrection power is life-changing. And it turns doubt into belief. And we're going to pray in just a moment. And I want to speak to anybody that's in this room or anybody that's watching online that right now you're having doubts about your faith. And you think about these stories, people getting healed. You think about Jesus coming out of the grave on the third day. And you have doubts about your faith. And I want to tell you that that resurrection power, it turns doubt and to believe that there are some things in life that are incredible and yet they're true. And one of the things that's the most incredible, but it's true, is the fact that when they came to the grave on that Sunday, the stone had been rolled away, the body was gone, that he appeared to over 500 people. And those witnesses, they went out, they're the ones that told the world. Many of them arrested, many of them beaten, most of them killed, martyred, none of them who were counted because they saw what they saw. They saw the resurrection resurrected Christ. And I believe today that God is going to turn some doubt into belief. Just like Thomas, he doubted. And listen, God is not afraid of our doubt. But Jesus came to Thomas and he said, stop doubting. Believe. Believe. It's real. It's true. And some resurrection power. I want to have a word of prayer today. Maybe you're going through sorrow in your life. Maybe you're experiencing grief and the resurrection power. It turns our grief into joy. It turns our grief into joy because it shows that we have a reason to rejoice. 
every day of our life, even if we're going through something really difficult, even if we're going through something terrible, we still have a reason to rejoice because we know our pain is temporary. That weekend was just temporary. The tomb was borrowed, the tomb of Christ. So I want to ask you, would you do this with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you're watching online, would you just take a moment of just solace and close your eyes for a moment and I want to first pray for those that are having doubts with your faith. You're having doubts with your faith. Someone that you hear the story of a man walk on water and you hear the story of a man who came out of the grave. You say, you know what? That just sounds, it sounds like the lady that had a baby in February and a baby in March. It sounds unbelievable. It sounds, it's just so tough to believe. And that's the way Thomas was. The apostle, the missionary, the evangelist, the apostle to Asia and India. He went so many places. How many churches are named after Thomas? How many groups of Christians trace their lineage back to Thomas? They say Thomas is the first one that told us. Doubting Thomas. And I want to speak to that today if you're doubting Thomas. It's a, it sounds incredible. A man came and he did miracles that killed him. And then he came up out of the grave on the third day. But I want to speak just like Jesus spoke to Thomas. He said, Thomas, stop doubting. Believe. And Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus, just like you appeared, you appeared physically to Thomas. But I pray, God, that you would be revealed right now in this place to doubting Thomas. I pray that you would reveal yourself by the power of your Holy Spirit. Show doubting Thomas. God, that you're real, that doubting Thomas would say, my Lord and my God. God, I pray that you would save people right now. I pray that you would, if that's you, if you've doubted, just surrender to your life. Just surrender to your life. Say, Lord, save me. Say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, forgive me. Just call out to him right now. If that's you, if that's you, if you're the one that doubt, just call out to him. Maybe you're even in the faith, but you had doubts. You're just struggling right now or wrestling with your faith. Call out to him. Say, God, help me. Help me show yourself to me. Help me to believe. I pray for that one right now that's stricken with grief in your life. That the circumstances, the cards you've been dealt or the hand you've been dealt or whatever has, has caused you to be stricken with grief. And I, thank, I, I pray that you would, I pray that today, that even though maybe you might be going through a tough circumstance even now, but yet you're going to walk in that resurrection power because he said, you're going to mourn, but your grief is going to be turned to joy. Blessed are those that mourn for they shall be comforted. And I pray right now in Jesus' name, as we walk in the resurrection power, I want to know, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, that power that turns that fear into boldness and belief and faith. And God, I pray that you would help us to experience that resurrection power today. Help us as a church, God, to walk in that resurrection power. We know you in the fellowship of your suffering. We know you in the power of your resurrection. And so God, today, Lord, we just, we, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, I celebrate you, Lord Jesus. You're, you're not suffering anymore. You're seated on the throne. You're at the right hand of the Father. And you're returning for us one day. And Lord, we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. But God, before you, but Jesus, as we, as we wait for you, I pray that you would save the lost. I pray that you would help us. God, help us to walk in your resurrection power. Help us to share your resurrection power. Before we, before we close today, I want to just ask this question. Is there, maybe there's somebody online or maybe there's somebody in the room today and you, you're just having doubts, but, you're, but the Holy Spirit is working on you right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking on you, to you. The Holy Spirit is, he's revealing to you. He's saying, stop doubting, believe. And if it, maybe you're in this place today and you say, you know, I'm, I've had doubts in my faith and I know that I need my faith to be strengthened. I need my, my belief to rise up today. I need to put my faith in Jesus. If that's you, would you just raise your hand real quick, real high? So I need to put my, I'm having doubts in my faith and I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ today. I need my faith strengthened today. Maybe you're in here and say, I just need my faith strengthened. I'm wrestling with issues in my faith and I need God to strengthen my faith. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up real high today? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can we just have this brief, just word of prayer together? Would you just, can we pray this? Can we pray this prayer together for those that are struggling with their faith? Can we just pray this profession of faith? Would you pray this for me? Just say, Lord Jesus.
Come on, would you say this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Help my faith. The stories of the gospel about you coming to life. Lord, help me to believe. Show yourself to me. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God, I just thank you so much for the Resurrection Sunday and this service and this group of people and those that are watching online. And God, I pray that as we walk out of this place that the celebration of resurrection power would not be a one day a year, that celebration of resurrection power would be something that we walk in 365 days a year. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Happy Resurrection Sunday.